Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cynthia Nations, current president of UC Master Gardeners of San Mateo in San Francisco counties. We welcome you to our third spring edible series entitled Spring and Summer Vegetable Garden Planning. Our co-presenters today are UC Master Gardeners, Lisa and Kathleen Putnam. Lisa has a BS in agricultural economics from UC Davis. She currently operates a sustainable organic farm in Woodside. She's also a UC master composter. Kathleen is a professional organic vegetable gardener serving the mid peninsula. peninsula. She is an international society of uh, arboricultural certified arborist and has a certificate in environmental horticulture from City College of San Francisco. During this presentation, you have an opportunity to type in any questions you may have. Please type in the name of your city before typing in your question. After the presentation, our chat monitors will select questions for Lisa and Kathleen to answer. If your question isn't answered, you can type in your questions on our MG helpline and helpline information is found on our website where you registered. A copy of the presentation and the video Will, um, will be found on our UC Master, um, Master Gardener's website within the week. Take it away, Kathleen and Lisa. All right, thank you so much, Cynthia. Appreciate thank the you, introduction. <laughs> um, and thank you everybody for showing up. Um, we know that we're one year into the pandemic and many, many people are Zoomed out. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. So we're going to cover spring and summer vegetable gardening today, and let's get into it. Um, so we're kind of going to cover the why, where, when, what, and how of having a vegetable garden. Uh, we'll touch on pest protection, um, the value of daily observation, and some tips on some of the families. And uh, that's a bouquet I made a few years ago. Uh, few years ago, last April. April is the month for artichokes and asparagus. So I put them in my flower bouquets. Um, so let's start off with why. Why grow your own vegetables? Because there's so many terrific farmers markets. Um, but there's just, there's a lot of satisfaction. And I honestly, I use my vegetable garden like I would a grocery store. I go out there, I don't know, at least several times every day and pick vegetables and what's for dinner, it's always gonna be what's in the garden. So uh, just right before this started, I went and picked a huge head of broccoli and tonight it's gonna be uh, beef and broccoli for dinner. Um, those are some summer dinners that, you know, shishitsu peppers and uh, some, the beginning of a tomato soup. And so I just think it's, to be honest, it's just so much fun. Um, and then Kathleen will go over um, why grow your own? Well, since commercial fertilizers have become available, um, the plants no longer go out and forage and make relationships with the life in the soil and the nutritional value of our vegetables since 1940 has significantly reduced. <clears throat> so if you grow your own vegetables organically, they're going to be excuse me, way more nutrient dense. Yeah. And just a heck of a lot more tasty too. Yeah, Nutri nutrient density equals taste. Yeah, that give me yummy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so where, grow, where should you grow your veggies? Um, you really only need three things, um, but it's helpful if you have a few other <laughs> things. Um, you need sun and you need a lot of sun. Um, you need living soil with lots and lots of little worms and life in it, and you need water. And if you have those three things, you're off to a really good start. Um, I put up on my slide, you also need patience and curiosity and the power of observation, um, which those will then bring you to the next level. But to start off, all you need is, is those first three things. Um, Leaf vegetables and your root vegetables, you can get away with a little bit less sun, like six hours of full sun. For your fruiting vegetables, which are all your summer stuff, your tomatoes, 
cucumbers, um, corn, um, all those things, you need at least eight hours. And when we say full sun, that means if you're out in the garden and you put your hands out or your body, the sun is hitting you. It's not dappled. It's not sunny, but not on your plant. It's actually sun hitting the plant for photosynthesis, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, and I will say, I find this over and over and over again. If you have those three things, enough sun, soil, and water, living soil, um, the garden kind of takes care of itself. You don't, um, you don't get huge infestations unless the plant's dying. Um, you don't, you just, you don't get the pest problems and you don't get a lot of the problems because everything that plant needs to thrive, it has. So uh, it saves you a lot of heartache. Um, and yeah, Kath Kathleen puts this, um, you can't negotiate with the plant. And I can't tell you how many gardeners have asked us, you know, well, I don't have six hours, but I've got four. And it's like, no, the plant needs what it needs. It's not a, you know, it just needs what it needs. And so um, it's not really a negotiation with the plant. Um, another where is, do you do it in the ground or do you do it in raised beds? So on the left, in, it's on the left for me, I'm not sure if it is for you, but those are my raised beds at my current garden. And on I've got left. eight. Okay. <laughs> I've got, <laughs> I've got eight raised beds and, um, I, and this is kind of nice as I get a little, little older, um, but it's also very expensive to do all those raised beds. The one on my right is my garden in Woodside and it's just in the ground. Um, and that didn't cost me, I have tea tape, which is very inexpensive. Um, that garden did not cost me much to put in. So uh, part of its budget, part of its space, part of its um, just what you prefer. Um, plants have grown in the ground for eons. Yeah. I will say my personal preference is in the ground because <clears throat> then that plant can access the entire soil food web. Um, in, in a raised bed, it's more of an artificial environment. Uh, you get better drainage, which is a plus, but um, I, if it was just up to me, I'd probably just do in the ground. Why do you have raised beds? My husband likes the look of it. Um, was it a gopher issue also? I do have a lot of gophers, but I have a lot of paper white narcissus, you know, so like my fruit trees, I never had a gopher problem with my fruit trees. So... A lot of think, people do raised beds though because they have gopher problems, don't you think? Yeah, that's true. And I did put gopher. So on the bottom of the uh, raised beds, I put hardware cloth, quarter inch hardware cloth, which is uh, to keep the gophers out. And I actually made it go up the sides of the beds, like by six inches or something. Because so, those little gophers, if they get a little area that they can squeeze their little bodies into they will <laughs> and then we're going to have issues <laughs> uh we're still on where um how much space do you need um and this is just you know we're so lucky and so blessed and we pay the property taxes to live in california um but it means really you can grow vegetables year round and so i know kathleen and i are just always jockeying in our minds it's like, okay, I just planted out my entire spring garden, but I know April 15th, I'm gonna be planting my entire summer garden. Where are all those things gonna go? Where's my zucchini gonna go? Where's my cucumbers and my tomatoes and eggplant and peppers? Because right now I'm pretty well packed out. Um, but I am always thinking that, and I know my tomatoes are gonna be squeezed in with my broccoli. And I know my peppers and eggplant are gonna go where my bok choy is. And, so, but just always be thinking about three to six months ahead of time of, you know, space. Um, and I would say, oh yeah, it is on this slide. Um, for a family of four, I would say if you're doing raised beds, you need about four raised beds. Um, and, and that would be enough vegetables. 
Okay. And I would say the, the minimum number of raised beds you want is at least three so that you can rotate your um, tomato families through them every third year. Yeah, good point. Good Which point. Lisa will get into that, but I think yeah. three is a nice minimum number. Yeah, yeah. And there's also guerrilla gardening going in. I mean, so my garden is to the left. It looks kind of wild and crazy. But then I didn't really have room for my artichokes. So I went to my dad's house and I planted my artichokes at my dad's house. Anyway, you know, you can, <laughs> you can kind of tuck things in uh, when your neighbors aren't looking. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kathleen, we're still on where we're on the living soil of where. Yeah. So the soil food web is an amazing thing. And it all, starts with sunlight hitting the leaves of your plant and your plant converting that energy into chemical energy, carbohydrates. And they give a third of their energy to the life in the soil, which starts the, the soil food web. And the fungi and the bacteria, it, it all feeds the plant, but you wanna feed your soil in order to feed your plant. Okay, and then how do you feed your soil? You cover crop. <laughs> <laughs> That's my new answer to every question that I get is, is cover, cover crop. crop. <laughs> <laughs> um, you grow a diversity of plants and yeah. you wanna rotate families. Lisa will get into families, um, feed the soil. If you don't cover crop, put compost and cover your compost with mulch because you want to protect that compost. It's full of life. You don't till your soil because um, you're releasing carbon when you when you dig into your soil, like farmers with their no with their um, what's it their whatever that machine is called. Like a and um, if you go on a raised bed. We really like um, Lingso's Veggie Blend, and for compost, make your own is the best. But if you don't make your own compost, make uh, um, Lingso has a distal turkey compost, which is very nice. Um, and always, always, always mulch. You yeah. don't want your soil naked. Yeah. So keep your soil covered. I could tell my Megan story. Should I tell my Megan story? Sure. This will put it in your mind and keep it in there. Um, it's also Je Kathleen and I went to a seminar. I think it was Chris Nichols, who was um, Dr. Chris Nichols, who was going by farms in California. She's, I think, from Minnesota and uh, <laughs> North Dakota. Oh, she's from North Dakota. I probably can't say the word she was using. No, don't. Okay. But she was going by farm after farm in California. She's like, dumb, dumb person, dumb person, dumb person. <laughs> and basically the, the, the ground was just ground. It wasn't covered. And she's like, you're in California. Keep that soil covered. No excuse. She didn't want to hear any excuses. And it did remind me of my niece when she was in uh, preschool. And she decided she wanted to go to school naked that day. So her mom said, fine, we'll go to school naked. That's what you want to do. So they drive down to the preschool. It's time for her to get out of the car. And she's like, uh, maybe this wasn't such a great idea. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and luckily her mom had packed um, some clothes. So little Megan got her clothes on and went into preschool. But just remember that. Keep that in your mind. You do not want your soil naked you'll embarrass yourself if you have your soil <laughs> naked. So if we see your soil naked, we will ridicule you. <laughs> <laughs> so no naked soil. <laughs> okay, point well made, I think. Yeah. Um, why feed the web? Um, it'll increase your organic matter. Like I said, a third of the plant's energy goes into the soil, which is liquid carbon. Um, it increases your soil organisms. It increases your water holding capacity. It cleans the water as it moves through and it improves your soil structure. That's good stuff. 
So yep. we just never think in terms of feeding the plant. We 100% think in terms of feeding the soil. What's going to make the soil more alive? What's uh, how do we protect this soil? And don't worry about the plants. They're they're completely down the list of what's important. Uh, okay. Uh, Kathleen, you want to do Gay Brown? Yeah, Gay Brown is a uh, a farmer in North Dakota who has he grows soil. You know, it used to be that uh, sustainable agriculture was what everybody thought was great, but Gabe looked at his soil and he said, I don't want to sustain this. I want to regenerate this, which is the new word now that everyone is using. But um, the, the principles are disturb the soil as little as possible. So you don't want to till. Um, you always want to have roots in the ground. The greater the diversity, the healthier your soil will be. It's like, it's like people, right? You want to eat a diversity of food. If you only drank Diet Coke, you're not going to be very healthy. Um, always have your soil covered, whether it's with roots or with mulch. And he says incorporate animals. He's a farmer. Um, you know, that might not be realistic for everybody. I just asked my spouse if we could um, I have chickens in our garden for one hour every day. And she said, no. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, you can't always incorporate animals, but you can behave as an animal when you cover crop by mowing it. Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, if you are making your own compost and you don't have any animal manure in there, uh, you could just get like a little bit of the distal structured compost from Lingso. Um, but it does make a complete compost uh, when you have a little bit of animal manure in there. Um, and if you're looking for resources, um, I, Gabe Brown's book, Dirt to Soil, is a great book. Um, and this came out, I think, 2020, Kiss the Ground with, um, it's Woody Harrelson, who is the narrator on that. Or there's, a, you can just Google, these are, a lot of them are on Netflix, Symphony of Soil, Living Soil. Listen to talks. Again, you can just Google Dr. Chris Nichols or Dr. Christine Jones. She's from Australia. Uh, Dr. Christine Olson, all women. Um, and they're, they're fantastic soil scientists. And uh, most of them have done TED Talks. So you can Google them. And Kathleen and I, and along with her brother Kent, went to visit uh, Singing Frog Farm, which is a no-till farm up in Sebastopol. They're probably, I don't know if they're doing farm tours still. Uh, you could see. I'm just not sure with COVID. but. Um, Anyway, there's lots of places to learn about no-till farming and how to protect your soil. So those are just some good resources. Uh, oh, cover, cover crop. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to everything in life. The answer to everything. Because cover crop will improve your soil. Lisa and I um, just had a disagreement on one of our clients. And Lisa thought we needed to take this, all the soil out of her raise beds and replace it with Lingso Veggie Blend. And I said, we can fix this with cover cropping. So we put on a layer of a very high quality compost. I throw, threw out a huge diversity of seeds and then I covered it with some mulch, watered it and her soil is amazing now. <laughs> it's you true, I believe I, it. I totally stand corrected. She had soil in there that was as dead as dirt. I mean, it was, there was no life in her soil. And I thought there was no way to bring that soil back. Um, and I, so I was the one who recommend, let's take that soil out. We've got to go get, we need to start fresh here. And it's probably now the best soil I have seen. I mean, it's, I God, I wish you guys could see it. I did take some photos. I didn't put them in this presentation. That soil is just absolutely, it's like butter. I mean, it's just beautiful. So, good crop. job, good job, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, we're, we're hitting it hard on cover crops today. Uh, rotation, cover crop. So um, I think it's the next slide or two. We go into plant families, but you don't want to plant the same family over and over in the same place. Let's say you are in beds. 
You don't want to do beets followed with spinach, followed with amaranth, followed with quinoa, followed with chard. Uh, all those guys are in the same family. Um, it's uh, you know they get a little they get a little leaf miner, and then that leaf miner is going to drop to the soil, and it's going to pupate, and it's going to you know you're just planting the host plant for that exact insect. So you want to always rotate your your crops. Um, it's more important probably in the soliensia in the tomato family than in any other family. But um, if you just go grow a diversity and don't don't grow the same plant in the same place year after year. I I, I have an issue with this slide, Lisa. What's that? Um, you say the plant you can group by plant, plant family, which I agree with. Yeah. But the heavy or light feeders, I disagree with. Okay. Because the plants actually, it's, we now know that the plants, they don't really take from the soil. I mean, certain families are going to take certain nutrients, which is another reason to rotate, but it's not like they're a heavy or a light feeder because they all give to the soil. Well, that's interesting. You know, that's actually, I think from when we took our classes, from 10 years Pierce, ago, which she was very chemical. Yeah, we took it. Uh, Kathleen and I took a series at City College um, from Pam Pierce, who's an amazing, incredible vegetable gardener. Um, but that's uh, that's kind of a little bit older thinking now. So that's yeah. good. I should fix the slide. No, I think it actually leave it and we can it makes for discussion. OK, good. Chop and drop. We should mention chop and drop since we're on cover cropping still. Yeah, so you take your head shears, which are about this long, and you just chop, chop, chop. and you chop about oh, three or four inches. I'm actually teaching a cover crop class November 25th with Los Altos, if anybody November. wants to take it, or um, Lingso has a cover crop class on their website that I taught. And um, so chop and drop is you're essentially making mulch. It's free mulch. Yeah. So in the way why it's called chop and drop is you just start at the top and you chop, 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 and you just let it drop to the ground and it just stays there. And then you don't have to be called a dumb person because you don't have your soil covered. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that kind of hits. Yeah. Okay. We got that. So now we're on to the water part of why when? Um, do you want to go over irrigation, Kathleen? Yeah, irrigation is, I mean, you can hand water. You better go out, you know, once every three days or one, yeah, once every three days. If you're hand watering, you will, you will pay more attention to your plants if you're hand watering. Um, I used to work at a retail nursery and a lot of people do have irrigation systems and drip irrigation. And I would ask them, well, how often and for how long is this plant being watered? And almost always they'd say, oh, well, it's on the clock. Well, that's not an answer. <laughs> that's, that doesn't tell me how often or how long. So yeah. you need to be involved with how often and how long it's being watered. A general rule, I think, is once every three days for mm, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and what we see a lot is closed loop systems, which are not good. And I don't know why everybody seems to install those, but that's when at the end of the line, instead of just ending and putting a little goof plug or a, a clean out valve or clean out, it's not a valve, drip, dripper. Um, people tee it onto the line and they have it all enclosed and that's not good. There's no clean out on that. Yeah. And there's and no need for it. Yeah, we see it all the time. Um, I'm not sure how or why that became popular, but we constantly see people doing a loop system in their raised beds. So yeah, you just want straight lines that end. Yeah. Um, water in the morning if possible, but it doesn't really matter. Just water when your plant needs it. Uh, don't rely on your timer. Still check often. 
Oh, and, and here's, your finger. <laughs> here's your best water meter is your finger. Um, I just wrote to a master gardener who's relying on a water meter. And when I worked in retail, we got these water meters in and I stuck one in a lemon, a ripe lemon. And it registered dry and it registered pH of like eight, which is ridiculous. A lemon probably has a pH of five or six. Yeah. So unless you buy a really expensive, but I mean like a $200 meter, just use your finger or dig down a little bit and see if there's moisture. Yeah. Um, when do we think? So now we're, he we're on to the win of when do you do what in your garden? Um, and I have a chart. I think the next slide's a chart. But December and January, basically, you don't do a whole heck of a lot. But right now, February, March, is when you're putting all your spring crops in. So your spring crops are your brassicas, which are the, they're the superstar. They're your fall and your spring crops are the same. Um, but when you plant a spring, uh, a spring kale or a spring broccoli, that plant's going to be with you for a long, long time. <laughs> so you've got to really consider where you're putting it. Um, for instance, a, a fall planted marathon broccoli right now, mine are totally have gone to flower. They're almost all gone to seed now. Yeah, me uh, too. They're covered with bees. Um, if you plant that exact same plant, a uh, marathon broccoli in February or March, that is going to keep producing all spring, all summer into fall. And it might finally give up the ghost in October. But uh, so it's a much different, um, even though you're planting the exact same crops, your spring and fall crops are the exact same crops. They're going to react very differently when you're growing from cool into warm versus warm into cool. So right now we're going cool into the warm. We're planting February, March, headed towards April, May. And again, that comes to the hard part of California gardening is that uh, you're planting heavily out with all your, um, all your brassicas. So cabbage, cauliflower, uh, broccoli, kale, um, and then all your lettuces, that whole family, uh, arugula, beets, chard, spinach. Carrot carrots, uh, onions, turnips, turnips, parsnips, <laughs> sugar snap peas, sugar snap peas. Um, so then it comes April 15th, I planned out all my tomatoes, my peppers, um, all my and summer stuff. Why April 15th, Lisa? So, and we'll get into that, but that is the, for me in Portola Valley and Woodside, that's my last frost date is April 15th. Now, if you're in Redwood City, you could probably go a little bit earlier than that. Um, might be able to do early April. Um, but I tell you every, every year it surprises me. I, I think, oh, it's such an unusual year. It's been such a dry year. We won't get any more frost. And sure enough, tax day, we get nailed with frost. So I just do April 15th, I do my summer crops. And, uh, and yeah, I should, my mom, my parents are both farmers, Kathleen and my parents are both farmers. And my mom said, until you can sit with your bare bottom in the soil, don't put your tomatoes in. So I think that's a good little, a little good little test. If, um, if you put your tomato in like now, I was at Home Depot the other day and they have tomatoes. It's just gonna sit there and do nothing until it warms up, which Lisa has a slide on their preferred temperatures. And really what you're doing is you're just exposing it to insects and disease until it can start fending for itself. Cause yeah. it's not gonna grow. It's just gonna sit there. Yeah, and then also you're making gardening really complicated by doing that because then people get walls of water and they, yeah. <laughs> they put a wall of water around it and then they put frost protection on it. And then it's just, it just, do what the plant wants. Don't try to contort it into your life. Work with nature. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't work against it. So yeah. Uh, 
this is my personal, this is like sitting right next to me uh, in my office. Um, I look at the, I swear to God, I look at this every single day. Um, and so right now we're in March, we're in the third column there. So you can do your arugula, you can direct, I direct seeded my arugula, oh, a couple weeks ago, it's all up. Um, tail end of asparagus, beets, bok choy, broccoli, cabbage, napa cabbage, cauliflower, chard, blah, 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 blah. You can read it, but um, so that's everything that's going in. A lot of it starting February, March, April, and then you can see in April, let's get a summer thing here. Let's go to tomatoes. So they put a question mark in April and they say, don't put your tomatoes in until May. Um, this chart, by the way, you'll get the link to it in the, uh, the credits. This is the Master Gardener, uh, Santa Clara County Master Gardener. So it's MG Santa Clara um, chart. And this is uh, by far my favorite chart. I love this chart. Um, yeah, it's a really good chart. And it works for Santa Cruz, Kathleen? Yeah, it does pretty much. Okay. I just think the whole Bay Area, whether you're San Francisco County, San Mateo County, um, this is kind of the chart to use. Yeah. I've never gone wrong using this chart in the Bay Area. Yeah. So um, again, you can get it and print it out yourself and color code it and stare <laughs> at it every day. I've, I've stared at this chart every day for like, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And you would have think I would have memorized it by now, but I, I just sit there like in January going, you know, <laughs> is it February yet? And then in February, it's just like, go on your market set and go. So and um, my, my hard stop date for tomatoes is Mother's Day. If I oh. don't have my tomatoes in by then, I'm in trouble. Okay. Okay. That's a good, and that's like the second or third week of. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, I don't know. So it's in May. It's in May. Yeah um what so we are in the what a uh, vegetable gardening so you can see on the left hand side your warm stuff and on the right hand side your cool things so warm likes it from 65 to 85 cool from 55 to 65 and right there in the middle from 65 to 75 you can do both um so the real temperate climates like a san francisco uh you have a really long growing season yeah, but you uh, never get 85. <laughs> yeah, but you never get, you don't get the heat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we kind of went through your families. You'll get this slide. I love this slide. It just puts all the families together. So your nightshade family, who's in your cucumber family, corn is a grass. Um, the only one that's a little tricky here is uh, is the, the bean, the legume family, because Beans are warm season, peas are cool season. So it's a little, little late right now to seed your peas, but pretty quick here, you're gonna be just, and for, for things, so we'll get into this too, but for legumes like that, I just go ahead and put the seeds right into the garden. You don't have to buy plants and you don't have to start them in six packs. You just go ahead and direct sow those. Um, and then that's all your cool, all your cool season stuff on your, and the, so the brassicas, the mustard family, those are kind of your superstars um, that everybody eat. A lot of people enjoy. Uh, Amaranth, they see E, which used to be your, uh, your goosefoot. Yeah. Yeah, Chinopo daisy. So that's and now, uh, and it's called goosefoot. If you look at the leaf of any of those, it looks like a goosefoot. Um, and your sunflower families, your lettuces, your carrot family, and your aliens. So those are your cool season stuff. Um, how, how to plant a plant? <laughs> it's a good question. Yep. Uh, Deep. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess maybe I don't have it on this. Side. Yeah, I oh, do. you okay. do. And yeah, so perennials, you plant high. So all your, all your vegetables are perennial, excuse me. All your vegetables are annuals. So you're planting those low. All your perennials, like your fruit trees, um you plant those up high because they're going to be in the ground forever and so, when lisa says low and high she means deep or not deep okay yeah maybe deep and shallow yeah deep and shallow yeah it's probably better yeah so, again, i know it's kind of like buy low sell high um <laughs> <laughs> so that's my garden basket that little basket goes with me everywhere and um uh, 
you don't need a lot. Gardening does not need to be expensive. And so I just, I have um, a soil knife and I have my pruners. I, I did, they're an ARS hand pruner. Felco is another good brand for a hand pruner. I like the ARS because you just squeeze it and it opens up. And I like that. I have my little pocket boy, which is my little pruning saw and gloves, which I wear on occasion. Um, the sharpener, so for the, the ARS, and Kathleen is the one who holds my hands to the fire on this, but um, you just go with your, I should have brought my little basket. Um, you just, oh, you've got it, Kathleen. I always and have it in my pocket. Okay. And you but just- I don't have pruners with me. <laughs> okay. But if but this is my pruner, you just go like that. Yeah, it's just like at a 45 degree angle away from the bevel. And just the blade. Just the blade. And you just go one way and you get it super, super sharp. And if you cut something and there's little fringe, there's little pieces sticking up, your, your uh, pruners are not sharp enough. And then you have to sharpen them. Uh, pull back. Okay, and then to plant a plant, all you do, you put your soil knife or your hand trowel in, uh, whatever, a few inches. Pull back, drop the plant in, release. Tap it down a teeny, teeny bit, just so those, the roots are in contact with the soil. But and, and that's if you're planting a little six pack. If you're planting like a tomato gallon, you're probably gonna need a shovel, but you wanna plant it so only this, this much is showing if it's a big tomato. Yeah. Because those leaves all along that stem, those will become roots. So, but pinch those leaves off and then that'll, you'll end up with a really good root system. Uh, okay, how seeds and starts. Um, I have started a whole bunch of tomatoes this year. I seed my tomatoes indoors on an electric blanket with my cat sitting next to it. Um, <laughs> And uh, usually I do that February 28th, which was my mom's birthday. Um, this year I did it March 2nd, uh, but they're all up and they all have their little seed leaves. And I do it six weeks before I wanna put them in the garden. I know I wanna put them in the garden April 15th. And so you just do the math. And that's when I seed all my tomatoes and eggplants and peppers. Um, cucumbers, you could direct sow. Um, and you know what, we get to a slide on that. So uh, the other thing to do is buy seedlings. Um, after COVID's over, the um, Master Gardener, we have a huge uh, spring garden sale with tomatoes and peppers and eggplant and tons and tons of plants, uh, herbs. And, uh, and so if you don't feel like seeding your own, just go ahead and um, you know, come to the master gardener sale. Um, and, and lots of, lots of nurseries have lots of varieties now, but you can do some pretty funky varieties, um, which are fun. Um, if you seed your own. Um, so that's one of the advantages of seeding yourself. And it's uh, less expensive. Yeah. It's very, very affordable. And you can make your own potting mix. It's super easy to do. Um, so the advantage is, yeah. And then also sometimes in the nursery, if you buy your plants, they're root bound and um, they just have a little harder, they have a harder time going out into the soil where with your own seedlings, that's not so much the case. But um, so that is how to seeds and starts. Uh, sowing requirements, I updated this slide a little bit. Um, anyway, so what must be, Direct so, so any of your root vegetables, carrots, beets, turnips, radishes, if um, those you just, you shouldn't buy those in a nursery, those you actually should direct sow because um, it's a root vegetable. So to transplant it, it's very upsetting to the plant. And it's, it's, it's super time consuming. Yeah. If, if you see a six pack of carrots, there's probably about 12 carrots in each little cell and you'd have to separate each little carrot out and plant it individually, which is ridiculous. Just throw some seeds down. Yeah. And then I have either direct sow or in flats, lettuce, arugula, kale. Um, kale, I actually do start in flats, but arugula, I always just throw that out. Yeah. Lettuce, I just throw the seeds out. Uh, spinach, I poke it in. 
um, peas, I, I poke those in, uh, beans, I have, I have fava, but actually just, you know, green be string beans. Yeah, just, any beans. Any bean, I just poke those in. Must start in flats or buy in a nursery, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, bok choy. I thought I moved that over to direct sow, but I didn't. And you uh, have tomato over there. That's just your spring stuff, huh? This is my spring stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, tomato. Summer uh, stuff all needs to be started inside. Inside because it's just too cold out. So I put mine outside today because it's such a nice day. I put my Except seedlings. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, how to prepare your bed. So this is my garden. And um, this is a couple weeks ago now. Kathleen bought me a whole bunch of, so the upper left is um, a whole bunch of six packs that Kathleen bought me. And so I put compost every single time. So three times a year before I plant, I go and I have a big, huge pile of compost. And then I have also some soil. I mix them up in my wheelbarrow. Um, and then I go uh, to my raised bed and I put in a whole bunch of compost and some soil. Then I lay out my little seedlings. This is broccoli. Lay out my little seedlings in a little pattern, like a little honeycomb pattern. And then I plant them just with the, the soil. Well, you can see my soil knife and you can see my little basket. And then I water them in with my dram redhead. Uh, mm -hmm. Give them a nice, nice water. And then uh, when we get to the pest, that thing you see upside down, that cage thing, I put that on top because birds love those little seedlings. Um, so you have to protect those seedlings at first. Once they're big, like you can see the gigantic bok choy and the other two broccoli, which I just picked a huge broccoli off of that broccoli plant this morning. Nice. Um, the, the birds don't bother them anymore after they're that big. So, but when I do my tomatoes, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna put some compost. And so I go through the same thing three times a year. So I'm always adding compost to the garden. Just, uh, just uh, every time I plant out and I plant out three, three things. Uh, direct sow root vegetables, we already covered that. Um, spacing, you can just look at what it says on the little tag um, for spacing. Transplanting, um, just do it in a little honeycomb pattern if you wanna maximize your space. Um, protection, bugs, blights, and birds. So um, do you wanna cover this, Kathleen? Of of planting a, a hedgerow. Yeah. I always, well, I have three in bed, in ground beds, and I always have at least one of them cover crop. So I always have something flowering and I'm attracting beneficials all year long. Um, for brassicas, once you get aphids, it's probably time that they're done. I don't really worry about aphids on my brassicas. The leaf miner on Goosefoot, I actually really like leaf miners because I think they're so cool. Um, you can eat them. There's, there's nothing wrong with eating a leaf miner, but more often than not, they've left the leaf by the time you're eating it. Um, birds, rats, squirrels, Lisa's next slide. And Sluggo, you know, the, the little tiny seedlings, the, the slugs and snails will get to. So we do use sluggo, which is iron phosphate. There's nothing bad about it. Sluggo plus, on the other hand, has spinosad in it, which kills larva. So I don't use sluggo plus. I just use sluggo. Yeah. And I was at Costco the other day and they have, you know, the price is so good, but I didn't buy it. They had sluggo plus, which, yeah, I just don't want to kill the larva. So which um, it's going to kill the life in your soil, which is why we're saying we don't want to use it because a, a lot of the life in your soil is larval. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's, there's exclusion. The, oh yeah, there's exclusion. So uh, you can see my husband, he's taking a picture of our cat Zazzo. <laughs> <laughs> but he built these things. So I have my beds. Uh, you can see actually the picture behind me is, um, 
is upper upper right those, those are my beds and he just he made a uh he made this uh out of wood and then took half inch piping and bent it around the wood so made these forms and then covered it with quarter inch chicken wire and so it uh it's actually been really effective um at keeping squirrels rats birds um, and I don't have to keep it on the whole time. They're pretty easy to take off. I can do it by myself. And uh, so those have worked really well. I just keep them on until the plant is big enough. It can kind of fend for itself. Um, and then that's actually a client of Kathleen's, uh, the lower left. And that's another way. And I like, I like that system a lot where it's taller beds. So you just keep them on. But you can also take those covers off when you're growing your tomatoes, which can get six, seven, eight feet tall. Uh, you, you don't need those. So you can take those off for some of your summer crops. Um, the other one's my garden in Woodside. Floating row cover, when I put a hole, I've seeded that entire bed in the middle, bottom middle. And then I put floating row cover over it because the birds will come and eat all the seeds. Um, and you know, the other thing I like is tool, um, T-U-L-L-E. And I don't know if Joanne's Fabrics is open or not, but I just went to a fabric store and bought tool. And um, what I like about that is the sun completely penetrates. And also you can see what's going on, which I kind of like. Um, so I, I, like, I like using that. You can see in those two lower left, I have the it's just half inch tubing that I put on rebar. And so if I wanna put a bird netting over, I can uh, put a bird netting. And there was a question earlier from a master gardener, Kathleen and I use the bird netting that they use in Napa. It's, um, it's not plastic. Well, it's, it's nylon, but it's knotted. It's knotted nylon. So it doesn't catch on every single button and doesn't catch on your zipper from your pants. And, it's uh, it's easy to work with. I just fold it up at when I'm done and I store it and then I use it again. You use it year after year. I guess I probably had some for 10 years now. Yeah, it's, um, it's a expensive initially, but yeah. you you use it over and over and over and you can use it on your fruit trees. You can use it. It's it's really nice. It's nice and it doesn't catch on every little thing and then it doesn't end up in the landfill, which is uh, uh, just a, a benefit. Yeah. Uh, rodents. Trap them. Trap them. E either exclude or trap. Yeah, you just don't have a lot of choices here. And that's so for Christmas, um, I asked for a have a heart squirrel and rat trap. <laughs> 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 Woo! And then I found out I don't have a heart. I, um, <laughs> I haven't used it yet. And oh. Bruce, my husband said, if you catch it, I'm not going to deal with it. You're going to have to deal with it. And so I haven't used it, you know, so there we have it. I don't have a heart. I have a heart trap, but I don't, I haven't used it yet. Um, so, so far I'm still doing exclusion, Yeah. but come fruit tree season, you know, I have a lot of fruit trees and then I'm going to be mad that I didn't trap my squirrels. So anyway. Uh, that I don't know. That's just what I'm going to say there. Harvesting. Oh, it takes forever. <laughs> We're getting towards <laughs> the end of our presentation. So yeah, harvesting, just factor it in. Um, it, I say plan on one third of your garden time to harvest. It just takes a lot of time, especially, I mean, cherry tomatoes. Oh my gosh. I don't even plant. Well, I plant like two cherry tomatoes now because they take so much time to harvest. Um, you know, cauliflower, not so much. It's kind of a one and done, right? You just, yeah. you cut off your cauliflower and then you go have dinner. But um, beans, peas, tomatoes, cucumbers, um, zucchini, zucchini, which gets this big, gigantic. <laughs> <laughs> You've just, you got to be out there, man. And you got to be on top of it. Um, you, you, you know, cause you, the more you harvest like a bean or a pea, then the more beans or peas you're going to get. Um, because 
the plant when it goes to seed is saying, okay, I'm done. But if you keep picking those, it's gonna keep producing, keep producing. So, um, which reminds me about successive sowing. Um, cauliflower really is one and done. It, it, it gives you your great big, huge head. And then never take the roots out, leave the roots in the ground, but just cut that plant off at soil level and give the leaves, if you have chickens, give the leaves to your chickens or eat them, they're delicious. Or chop and drop. Or chop and drop them. Um, but leave those, leave those roots in, the, in your soil. Um, but cauliflower is a one and done. So you don't wanna plant out 12 cauliflowers necessarily all on the same day. And you know, 60 to 90 days later, you've got 12 heads of cauliflower. Um, so you can space those and you can plant one cauliflower a week over um, eight weeks. Um, but then there's some things that you just see like cucumbers, maybe I'll seed those three times during, you know, I'll plant out my plants in April, but maybe I'll pop a seed in the ground in May and another seed in June and another seed in July. So it extends your harvest because they get bitter when you uh, when you're just trying to work off of the same plant the whole season. Now, that's not true with tomatoes. Tomatoes just keep producing, keep producing. Usually October, November, I have to take my tomatoes out. Uh, again, chop and leave those roots in the ground. Always just, leave the roots in the ground. Of everything. The, the, the soil food web, their favorite thing is living roots. Their second favorite thing is dead roots. And their third favorite thing is mulch. Yeah. Always leave, unless you have a, a diseased tomato, then pull out the roots. Yeah, yeah. Uh, single serving, okay, I think we covered Yeah, that. that's good. Yeah. Uh, general gardening tips. So this is our last informational slide, I think. So Kathleen and I, um, so when we go on garden consultations, we find the exact same thing over and over and over. And so we're gonna save you our consultation fee <laughs> <laughs> and just do not have your gardeners blow your soil it's, it's naked it's naked you do not want naked soil you want your soil covered cover it with leaves leave your leaves when your leaves drop leave them in place uh, if, if you can't stand that then put mulch down but don't ever have your garden, don't have your soil naked. And yeah, and blowing it just makes it cement. It's awful. It, it and just, a, a, a deciduous tree, actually, if you leave the leaves in place, the tree makes 99% of what it needs with the leaves that drop. So if you leave those leaves in place, you never need to fertilize that tree. Yeah. Ever. So it's just they form the leaves, they drop to the ground, feeds the tree. Yeah. Um, so, okay, what else do we find, Kathleen? So, yeah, and we've seen we've seen soil, and it honestly it looks like cement because it's been blown every week for years, and it's just it, it's actually it hurts our hearts. Um, uh, their their raised beds are in shade. Yeah, raised beds are in shade. The looped irrigation, we find the that all the time. irrigation and bad cuts on their trees. Yeah, hire an arborist. Um, if you know what you're doing for pruning, great, do your own pruning. If not, hire a professional arborist who knows what they're doing so they make good cuts on your trees. This has nothing to do with vegetables. These are just, <laughs> these are just gardening tips because we see it so often and it actually you know it, it affects us like personally yeah, um it, it hurts my heart to see stubs yeah it's just ouch so um february march you can still it's not too late to do all your weeding so do your weeding um just cut off the tops of your weeds leave the roots in hula ho it, or hula ho which is the easy way to leave your roots in and cut off the tops if you can't do that i do spray my weeds with 30 percent vinegar um you can pull them i mean we're saying leave always leave roots but um, oxalis i buy pull i try to get the nut the little nut but yeah so there are some weeds don't pull field bindweed um shoot I ever have a picture of it yeah because then it just breaks it just shatters the roots and then you have a million then you have a full-on bed of field bindweed so don't 
pull your field bindweed, just spray it with vinegar. Um, that's it. Or you can torch it. Oh, there's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's a huge cauliflower that I grew about uh, in a way a long time ago. And um, just, I really, I honestly, I do use my garden. Like this is dinner the other day was just, oh, I made a chimichurri sauce out of my parsley some sugar snap peas and broccoli. I did a stir fry, roasted some beets. Um, so, I mean, just use your garden like you would uh, running to the grocery store. Um, oh, we're at question, we're at a Q and A. And I think Cynthia Ooh. or um, Kathy's gonna give us some questions from chat. I'm gonna stop the screen. I think you're supposed to go to one more okay. slide. So, oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Do we have chat questions? Terrific. Kathy? Yes. So, uh, yes, I'm Kathy, do. and I'm one of the chat monitors, Master Gardener. Um, so, I'm going to be um, tag teaming with Debbie on the chat questions. We're giving voice to your questions. If you have any questions, put them in the chat box. First question from Menlo Park If you want to grow tomatoes in the same place each year, due to space limitations. Can you recommend how to amend the soil to reduce the likelihood of a buildup of pathogens specific to the nightshade family? Yes, in fact, UC Davis did a study, <clears throat> I think it was about two years ago, that you always wanna follow your tomatoes with broccoli and crab meal. And that kills the verticillium wilt and it's specific broccoli. It's not anything in the mustard family. It's broccoli and crab meal. And then you can, can, you can grow those tomatoes in the same spot. So Kathleen, it really does kill the verticillium? Well, yeah, it kills it. Wow. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right. Mustards kill a lot of um, pathogens. Yeah. But broccoli specifically kills verticillium. Okay. Okay. Kathy, you want to go for a couple questions? And then sure, I'll, I'll do that. Then. All right. Um, the next question then is coming up. And thank you very much for that. That was very good. Um, from Emerald Hills in Redwood City, I know you advocate for no tilling, but was wondering how to not disturb the soil as much when I'm digging up tree roots. I need to dig them up every season in order to plant anything into the beds. You've got mm. a problem. <laughs> <laughs> We, we actually just ran across this problem. We had a client that put her raised bed next to her boxwood and the boxwood, the, the raised bed was full of boxwood roots. Yeah. So we pulled out all the soil. We checked the gopher wire. Uh, we screened the soil. We added some compost to it and we put a root barrier around the bed so that the roots can no longer get into that bed. Yeah. With a tree. So this was boxwood and it was a trench, like a very narrow trench, two feet down, Kathleen, or 18 yeah. inches? Yeah, no, it was two feet down. Two feet down and then put a copper mesh um, or did that? Yeah, that we used a copper mesh, um, but we've also used just a plastic root barrier that you'd use around cane berries. Yeah. And you put that into the slot, the two foot slot. So you're trying to, of course, the roots are going to go where there's moisture and nutrients. I mean, they're going to go into your raised beds because it's delicious in there. Um, so you have to put a physical root barrier to stop those roots from getting into those raised beds. It's, it, it is a lot of work. Um, but it's a one time thing. Yeah, it's a one time thing. Now the the was it copper mesh, Kathleen, or am I? They put in copper mesh, and we found that that didn't work well. So then we used your stuff, my, my plastic. Um, copper mesh is kind of the latest. It's more recent uh, a product out there for a root barrier, but not that you want to have plastic in your soil, but plastic works, you know, it just doesn't disintegrate and it stops those roots from getting into those raised beds. Great. Thank you. 
Uh, next question. All the galvanized hardware cloth that I find has a Prop 65 warning for lead. Is there a hardware cloth that's available with different finish without Prop 65 warnings? Hmm. Wow, interesting. Have you come across that before, Kathleen? No, but I've never installed hardware cloth. My husband has, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. We're gonna have to look it up. Okay. Yeah, I, I would send an email to the master gardeners. <laughs> Yeah, that, do a little research. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, the email's on your screen, screen right now, but send that to the Master Gardeners because they, uh, they're required to look it up. But I did not know that. Hmm. It's good. That's good. Good, good question. Great. Um, the next question is out of Menlo Park. Is the San Mateo Recology Free Compost okay? Okay. <laughs> 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 Put you on the spot, little, huh? We well, have the same uh, face at the same time. I, I can say I I moved uh, three, four years ago, and I have a giant eucalyptus, so I bought a chipper because I would fill my green bin in an hour with all my eucalyptus debris. So the only thing I now put in my green bin is what is diseased, which mm -hmm. I think is probably pretty common for most people. Yeah. Not, not that they have chippers, but that if they don't want to put it in their compost pile or keep it on their property, they put it in their green bin. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not 100% comfortable using green bin compost. Yeah, it could have fire blight in it. It could have some, I think they get it really hot. Didn't you go visit one of those facilities, Kathleen? Yeah, they did get it really hot. They get it really hot. killed so all the life in it. Yeah, I mean, the good and bad of getting it super hot, it probably kills all the pathogens, but it also kills all the life. So I don't know how alive it is. Uh, to me, it would depend on the use. If you're using it as a mulch yeah, uh, in your landscape somewhere, you need some mulch and you don't want to use wood chips for some reason, I would think it would be fine as a mulch. I or would even a compost around your roses would be fine. Yeah, something like that around a perennial, I, I probably wouldn't hesitate to use it. But in my vegetable bed, I wouldn't. Yeah. Can I clarify something? So Kathleen, after you chip the eucalyptus, does yeah. it go in the green bin or does it go into your compost? No, it goes. I mulch it. Oh, you and, do? Okay. And you use it as mulch? I use it oh, as I mulch. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I just spread it all over the place. I, I never buy mulch anymore. Cool. Um, a follow-up question on mulch. Do you ever use pine needles as mulch? If oh, so, yeah. How does that go? It's great, especially if you have an acid loving plant. When I used to live in San Francisco and I used to drive through this expensive neighborhood that had um, a divide between the, the street going one way and the street going the other way that was planted with pine trees. So in the middle of the night, I used to go rake up those pine needles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't they, funny. They, were just, they weren't doing anything. They, they would just like take them away. So I would go rake up those pine needles and I'd put them around my hydrangeas and my, um, any of my acid, my blueberries, any of my acid loving plants. Yeah. Our pine needles are wonderful, but it, pine needles are great anywhere. Yeah, they're a little recalcitrant. So they're not gonna break down. Like let's say you're trying to get your soil a little more acidic around a blueberry plant. Pine needles are the perfect thing to put there, but it's gonna, they take a long time to break yeah, down. It takes time, but if you know, yeah, run, like, your, mm -hmm. run them, your mower over them and they'll break down right away. Yeah, yeah. Debbie, did you want to ask some of the questions or should sure. I? Sure. Uh, this I'm Debbie and a uh, master gardener, and this is a question from Min Yan from San Mateo, and he asked for feeding the soil compost three times a year. How much compost do you need to add or replace? And is it different between Lingso diesel compost and backyard worm compost? Yes. <laughs> so for Lingso diesel, which is super powerful, super alive, when we say something super powerful, what we need is it has a lot of life in it. Um, you probably only need a quarter inch. You don't need a, a lot of it. Um, your backyard compost, I use, I probably use about two inches. Um, three times a year. And I do find, uh, you know, especially in a raised bed, 
your soil levels do go down. So you do need to replenish with compost. We don't work it in. Uh, we're both, we're both no-till, but I just put it on top and then I plant right into it. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, this is from Eric in San Mateo. I'm new to gardening, so I don't know what is or what isn't a cover crop. What would be some good cover crops to put in my raised beds until I can start my spring summer gardens? I know you guys touched on cover, uh, cover crops, but maybe you can mention um, some names and where they could po potentially buy them. You know, what I would do, because um, diversity is the key to a really good cover cropping system, I would just go buy like a can of Renee's wildflower seeds and I would just throw those out there. And especially in a raised bed, I don't think I would put grasses into a raised bed because they can, they can be a little bit of a pain around my fruit trees. I would certainly use grasses, but yeah, just go get a can of wildflower seeds and throw them in there and water them till they germinate and you're good to go. Yeah. And typical cover crop seeds, though, would, let's say you're not in a raised bed, would have some rye and some oats um, or barley or barley. But another good one is also buckwheat. Um, it's yeah, buckwheat's easy. buckwheat's great. Buckwheat, it germinates right away and it just, it grows so quickly. And so it's a really fast cover crop. It's, a, it's get, we're getting a little bit towards the tail end of spring planting, you know, we're getting pretty quick oh, here. You could totally cover crop with wildflower seeds right now. Yeah, no, you could, but just if he's going to try to get in a spring planted crop, um, yeah. but go ahead and, and cover crop and cause then you're going to, and just plant right into it for your summers or your tomato and all your, all your summer stuff. The only cover crop I don't like, which you see in a lot of mixes, I know um, like Wegmans has a cover crop mix is veg oh. and veg I find very hard to get rid of. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the cover crops are invasive. Like I did use uh, wildflower seeds. I have poppies now all over my whole. Yeah. Which is great. They're property. <laughs> yeah. No, they are pretty. Okay, okay. Uh, another one on cover crops is from Cecilia, and she's just wondering, should she rotate her cover crops using different types of um, Not if you crops? use the diversity, not, and when I say diversity, I mean at least eight different types of plants. Um, no, you can use the same eight different types of plants every time you cover crop. Although something that's going to thrive in spring, summer is not going to be the something that thrives in yeah. fall, winter. So there are winter cover crops. There's winter wheat. Um, and then there's more summer, uh, spring, almost every, you know, spring, almost everything grows. But um, so I would do it more on time of year of, um, you know, another good site to go is um, grow organically. It's the um, Peaceful Valley website. And they have tons they, of different. Yeah, they have a great chart. Yeah, they have a great chart of cover crops. Um, and just go look at that. And then they'll tell you what times a year that they're better for. Um, so I think that's a good resource. And Kathleen, you use Nature's Seed a lot. I do use Nature's Seed a lot. They have, they're inexpensive. They're in Utah. They have wildflower mixes. They have cover crop mixes. They have a lot of stuff. But you also do not need to plant a legume in your cover crop. There is free living bacteria in the soil that fixes nitrogen. That's all, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> okay. Hey, Kathy? <laughs> we have a question about squirrels. No matter what, I cannot keep squirrels out of the cupboard with chicken wire raised garden beds. Any tips? I actually do think trapping. I mean, I know I haven't use my have a heart <laughs> well trap. it's it's um i think it's illegal to kill native squirrels uh but tree squirrels i think like native look it up on the uc ipm because there is some laws regarding squirrels okay 
and I don't, I don't know the laws. I don't think you can take a furred animal off of your property. Yeah, but I don't even know if you're allowed to kill the native squirrel. Okay, look yeah, it up. You're, you're going to have to look it up. Send an email to the Mastercard. <laughs> yeah. But you just it, thought of the issue. That's the main thing. Right? But now this person is covering it with chicken wire. Oh, that's what she says. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. Not covering it well enough. Yeah, there's a there's a there's somewhere where that squirrel's getting in there. Um, I mean, I will say with those things, the, those, um, well, I'm, I'm on top of them. You can see them behind me. Um, they, uh, they work for exclusion. I, I, exclusion is always our number one versus, versus trapping. But um, as long as there's no room for them to get in. But a squirrel, I know a rat can get in the size of a quarter and a mouse the size of a dime. So, I mean, it does have to be fairly small, the little... <laughs> Is she certain it's squirrels and it's not some other rodent? It's not a rat. Because yeah, we question. have a client who has um, rodents, not squirrels, that get into her vegetable beds. Hmm. Yeah. And they're, they're harder to exclude, but we do, we, we have covers on those beds that work pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so you. exclusion, I think our recommendation would be uh, figure out where they're getting in and uh, work a little harder at exclusion. And one way you could figure out where they're getting in is um, just take like flour and a, and a sifter and just put a white powder around the area where they are and you could see their little footprints Clever. and you'd be able to see, you know, you'd be able to find where they're stepping. Yeah. Smart. <laughs> Um, that's really clever. Um, do you have recommendations? This is about irrigation now. Okay. For a starter drip system. Go ahead, oh, Kathy. Do I have a recommendation for a starter drip system? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's some really, and I know we're supposed to give more than one source, but if you live in, on the peninsula, I would go to Urban Farmer in San Francisco. It's out by the zoo. And they have everything you need to do a hose and timer system. Um, and they're, they're super nice. I mean, you could go to Ewing in San Carlos. And there's also Horizon in Menlo Park. They're actually pretty nice. But if you go to Urban Farmer in San Francisco, they will make sure you have every part you need to do a hose and irrigation system, which you probably don't want to, you know, get a clock and valves and I don't even know how to do that. And I've been gardening for years. Um, but a hose end irrigation system, it's, it's not difficult. You just, you need the timer, you need a pressure regulator, you need um, a um, backflow, a backflow stopper, and then you need a, a the thing that connects the thing, see, that connects your um, thread to your irrigation line. And then you go to half inch line and to take it to your bed and then you go to quarter inch line to run along your bed. But I, I would go, Horizon would probably be okay, but Urban Farmer's amazing. So Great. I gave three choices. Thank you. Okay, this is our last question we have, um, only in terms of time because there are loads of more questions, but um, where are the best places to buy seeds? I love to buy seeds. I buy most of mine online, but um, if you want to buy them in person, I like Half Moon Bay Nursery. Yeah, they have a nice um, variety. They have, yeah. like, they have like Kazwana. What's the... Um, oh, Kazwana. Yeah, the, a lot of uh, the Asian... Um, they're actually headquartered, I think, in Oakland. Um, but a, a lot of your Asian greens, your bok choys and tatsois, and uh, they have some such interesting seeds. And they're at Half Moon Bay uh, Nursery. Um, but online, Johnny Seed. Um, what's the one in Oregon, Kathleen? Territorial. Territorial. I buy a lot of seeds from Territorial. I find they're expensive, and I find their shipping is a little expensive. Yeah. Same with Peaceful Valley. Their shipping is expensive. They're yeah. grow organic, right? 
yeah, groworganic.com there. You can buy seeds there from, yeah, Peaceful Valley. Um, but even, you know, Wegmans, um, Summer Winds, um, a lot of places have seeds, but I like, you know, I used to just do this for fun, but, you know, getting a seed catalog and just going through a seed catalog, it's amazing. You know, there's probably 200 different kinds of broccoli. Uh, there's just, you know, it's, it, it's, so it's fun. And then you finally hone in. I, every gardener goes through this, it, yeah. this curve of when you first, when I first started gardening, I was hand watering everything. You develop a relationship with plants and then you move to an irrigation system and, um, and then you grow really unusual stuff like Baker Creek. I was buying all my, all my stuff from these really unusual seed companies and growing some bizarre things and found a farmer and got all these slips for a hundred different varieties of sweet potatoes and peanuts, I was growing peanuts. And then, <laughs> and then you go and like, okay, that was fun. And then you go Look, to, I actually want stuff that tastes good and produces <laughs> consistently. <Yeah. laughs> then oh, you God. go back to the tried and true. Then you're back to like the Waltham broccoli and, and the sun you know, gold tomatoes. And and sun gold. <laughs> so you go through this, this, you know, learning curve and, you know, have fun. You have fun. Like I've, okra is so beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful okra is plants. beautiful. It's, but it's, I don't eat okra. Yeah. You know, that's it. We didn't even talk about it. I oh, wanted yeah. to keep the, the presentation going, but also plant, plant what you eat. Yeah, plant what you eat. If you know yeah. you don't eat collard greens and <laughs> okra, don't plant collard greens and okra. You know, if, if you know you absolutely love tomatoes, you plant a whole bunch of tomatoes. But um, <laughs> plant, and if you know you only are going to eat broccoli and you cringe at cauliflower, choy, yeah, then yeah, I know it sounds so common sense, but um, just really, yeah plant what you're, what you're going to eat, but have fun to, you know, go ahead and grow something completely bizarre, you know, kohlrabi. I, well, I'm growing kohlrabi again after not growing it for years, but, um, you know, it looks like an outer spit, you know, a space shuttle or something. And, you know, so it's, but it's fun tasty. and it is tasty. Mm -hmm. It is good. It's like, you know, anyway, yeah. so have uh, fun, you. but, and go through the whole cycle. Cause you have to do it. And then come back <laughs> to the tried and true. It's the learning curve. It's the learning curve of gardening. I hate to cut you off because we have so many more great questions. Um, <laughs> actually, two quick. I mean, someone wants to know the name of the knotted nylon bird netting name and where to purchase it in Napa. That's um, so it is what the Napa, uh, it's what the grape growers use. And shoot, I have it in my gardening shed, but I'd have to run out to my gardening shed to get it. I have the you package. Know, I just bought some and... I might have gotten it from A.M. Leonard, but I'm not positive. Shoot. Um, but I no googled question. netted nylon bird netting, and I, I think I found it that way. Yeah. And finally, someone wants to know, will the slides be shared? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. They're going to be, be on the website, right? Yeah. Great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. And I think. I think that's it. That's our references. Oh, that's my house. <laughs> my quince, my quince is blooming. Aww. And, um, and then thank you. Thank you, that's Master awesome. Gardeners. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, um, and Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to both of you. Sure. All right. Okay, See? every our audience, thank you for attending our spring edibles uh, presentation. This is the third in the series. Uh, Kathleen and Lisa, thank you so much for your excellent information and, and, and your humor. Every time I hear you present, it's, it's new information and great humor. Um, the, pres the fourth presentation in this series is Growing Herbs with Master Gardeners, Kathy Fleming and Cindy Morris. Uh, you can find the, uh, the registration information on the UC Master Gardeners of San Mateo and San Francisco County's website. If you have a question that wasn't answered today, you can email your question to the helpline and an MG will respond. The helpline information, a copy of the presentation, and the video link will be found on our UC Master Gardener website within the next week or two. Um, it depends on how long it takes for us to edit it. Thank you for attending and have a very great weekend, everyone. Bye.